welcome, welcome, welcome to all of our beautiful queens who are listening and to our special guests. Um, welcome to our queen call. Um, we are so excited that you have joined us this evening. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started, but first we would like to go ahead and open up in a prayer. Father God, we ask that you please open up our hearts and our minds. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the sacred time that we have with one another. We ask that you please bless us with your spirit, all those who are listening and all those who will be pre- presenting this evening. We ask that this call may be a benefit, that we may be inspired, that we may be able to apply, and that we may be successful with the information that is given to us on today. We thank you and we praise you and we ask for your guidance. Amen. All right. Welcome, 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 Queens, again to our March, March call. My name is Queen Oshia Muhammad. I will be your co-host along with Sister Queen Sadia Evangelista for this evening. We are extremely, extremely excited about our Queen calls. Um, for those, if this is your first time, welcome. If this is your second or third time, welcome back. Um, just for those who are new listening, um, just a little bit about Queendom Come. Um, and you can check us out at www.myqueendomcome.org. Queendom Come is a nonprofit organization created and designed to empower, inspire, and motivate young women and girls. Um, with so much negativity in the world, um, Queendom Come was born <clears throat> as a means for us to be a light in the midst of darkness. Um, we really want to teach our young girls and women their inherent value and their purpose their divine purpose so that they may be successful. Um, And so we act as a woman's group to support our young women and girls. Um, And with that being said, we have all types of programs that we participate in uh, in working with young women. We have a conference coming up in April, on April the 15th, our sister summit. Um, And so this is what the Queen Call was born out of. Um, One thing that we love to do is to share information with our sisters. Um, And so the Queen Call was born so that we can empower women and girls. Um, One way that you can help someone, of course, we know in order to be empowered that you have to have knowledge. And so Queen Calls are designed specifically for that as a sacred time, a sacred space where we as women can come together and support one another, encourage one another, inspire one another with our experiences. Um, And so with that, um, I'm going to keep it moving right along because we are so excited. The title of tonight's Queen Call is Queenly, How to Lead and Succeed in Creating Wealth in Your Queendom. Um, this is really, really a exciting topic and a very valuable topic because, you know, entrepreneurship, that's not really talked about so much in our communities, uh, and it really takes a shift in our mindset. But knowing how invaluable Queen O'Shea, are you still there? Hello? Yes. I think her call dropped off. But what we'll do is we'll, we'll get started. Now, she talked about the entrepreneurship and how, you know, as queens, you know, we have to forge a way for other women behind us, and we're naturally natural leaders, and so why not be natural leaders in business? So we would like to start with our first speaker, uh, Attorney Nyanza Moore. Now, I've known Nyanza since college, so that's maybe almost 20-something years. And I remember when I first met this queen, she definitely had the characteristic of a queen, and she was truly reigning on that Texas A&M campus in all areas of her life, not only in academics, but extracurricular, and also in sisterhood. And then we also went to law school together, and at the same time I saw that this this woman was able to take her skills and her sisterhood abilities and to help others and uplift others. And so now she continues with service in the community and as an entrepreneur, as an attorney. And so uh, a little bit about uh, attorney Nyanza Moore. She's been practicing for 15 years. She practiced as a litigation attorney 
uh, on the plaintiff side, and you can see her on Thursdays on Fox News. Her focus has included commercial, business, tort, financial, and real estate law, with a particular emphasis in deceptive trade practices, which she describes as the bad faith version of business litigation. Attorney Moore has considerable experience representing property owners against large financial institutions and is passionate about the advocacy for her client. So she is like a David tackling these Goliath companies. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce Attorney Queen Nyanza Moore. Attorney Nyanza. Thank you so much, Sadia, my friend, Queen Sadia. Um, I... I, I relish in the fact that we have known each other for 20 years, which dates me and you. But I have to say that in the time that I have had as a, I guess I should say, as a, as a person before being a woman, as a person who knew that I had visions for my life that entailed me being able to be the captain of my own ship. Since I was in the sixth grade, I started my own business. I had my own business in high school. I had my own business in college. I always had what people would call a side hustle, not anything that was underneath the table. It was always something truly legitimate. And whatever I did it for, I made sure I capitalized on it financially. And it was always something that was bred out of the necessity of something that I needed to get done in my life. Let's just say in the time that... I was in law school. We all went to law school to become attorneys. Some of us had different vision of, divisions of what that should look like. My vision of what it should look like was to be a woman who had her own business and to be an attorney, but at the same time use attorney as a turnkey to do other things. And luckily for me, I've been able to succeed in creating the wealth in my kingdom. And just like this topic of this speech is supposed to be, my thought process is I have the fortunate, you know, life that I have today because I have earned it. Nothing was given to me. I took what I believed I needed to take advantage of to get where I am. If I saw an opening in a new business, I would go after it. I think that for me, my ability to have laser focus on whatever goal I had was something that was a talent of mine that I honed over the years. In our college years, we lack focus. We can't figure out what our major is going to be. We don't know what we're going to be when we grow up, and we have those things where we're a little bit fluid. After college, and if you go on to graduate school, and then after graduate school, even then sometimes you're like, okay, I have a law degree, I have a bar card, but I don't really want to be a lawyer. I have to find something else to do. I opted to stay in my practice area and decided to create what I thought would be a lifestyle vision for myself. And what that enabled me to do was to become laser focused on what I wanted my life to look like when I turned 70. And it needed to look like me being the CEO of my own business, whatever that was, having a husband, having a child or multiple children, having the ability to have my business pay it forward to help other young women start their own businesses, kind of like a tree branch. And I wanted it to look a certain way with a little bit of bliss. I didn't take out of business the shark attitude, I kept my shark attitude and I kept my persistent attitude and what I focused on was what I, my mantra. And I believe that in everything I did, I needed to, number one, pursue persistently. Number two, produce prosperously. And third, perceive positively. If I could pursue it produce it and perceive it positively, then I know I can make it happen. And for me, I believed that for the dreams that I had of what I wanted to do, all of the small businesses that I had, and I'm going to give you two examples. I came to Houston, and of course I was already an attorney, and I thought, wouldn't it be nice if I could have a shirt and I could put some nice crystals on a shirt 
and, you know, have it say beautiful. Because at the time, you know, black people were saying, oh, everybody wanted to be, you know, changing their look. And I thought, you know, I came up with Bella, Bella meaning beautiful. And I said, you know what, let me, do, let me just put a T-shirt and put these crystals on it. So I said, I made a T-shirt for myself, and I, of course, since I'm the kind of person that believes that if you're going to do something, you have to do it the best. So I ordered Swarovski crystals, and I was like, oh, I put them, I hand-beaded them on a shirt, and I wore my shirt one time to the Galleria, just with just a regular casual day, and I had about 10 different women come up to me asking me where they could get that shirt. And I said, well, I made this. They said, oh, my gosh, so you have a business. Give me your card. I said, I made it for myself. And I instantly said, here's my email address. I will make one for you if you like it this much. And you can have it say whatever you want it to say. So at that moment, I said, okay, well, I had to go home. I told my then fiancé that, you know, I have another business I'm starting. He was like, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to make some shirts. I don't know if you all remember Ed Hardy, those shirts that everybody had, the really, really expensive ones. I did my beaded shirts before Ed Hardy. And when I decided to do that, I decided to put only about $500 into this. I found the best quality T-shirt I could find wholesale, and I ordered the best quality beads, only Swarovski, and I used the best glue, and I hand-beaded every single shirt. So then the Black Expo was coming to Houston, and I had already sold my shirts, and then I started custom making them in Greek letters because I'm in a sorority. And I was like, okay, everybody's buying these shirts. And they're like, I, I, I'm not a shirt maker, but this is a business. And I thought, hmm, I'll just do this and see what happens. So then, of course, somebody said, would you like a booth at the Black Expo? I was like, sure, I can do this. And I said, maybe I need to have at least maybe 100 shirts, and I'm going to sell them. You know, at the time I thought about my labor, and I thought about how much the bees are going to cost, and I was like, okay, this is, this is when you had to have a hard swipe credit card machine. This is very back in the day. And so I, I remembered that the Black Expo was in three weeks. I got my shipping shirts in, I got those beads done, and I hand-beaded those shirts. And I, my, my fiancé and I set up my little booth. We put a spotlight over the top of it, and I wore my shirt, and I asked two, I asked two of my girlfriends who had purchased shirts for me to just come, and to, come to the expo and just walk around in my shirts. I ended up, thankfully, finding a vendor who would manufacture the shirts for me the screening, so I would not have to hand do every bead, but with the same quality that I did it. So when I started getting the buzz that people were, like, taking pictures of my shirts and people started calling me, I decided, okay, well, let me see if I can up this order and put another uh, couple of hundred dollars in there and, and go ahead and take this, uh, this old coach bag to the pawn shop and see if I can go ahead and get some money from that to be able to go ahead and buy some more shirt products. I ended up with 250 shirts. I opened up at the Black Expo. I hung five of my shirts up from the top. I sold out of my shirts in three hours on the first day of the Houston Black Expo. I had lines wrapped around all of the other vendors because my shirts were the best quality and they were original and I was the only one who had it. For me, it was like, okay, this was successful. I made $6,000 that day. I put about $1,200 into that business. After the Black Expo first day, the next day I didn't have any more product. So the, the, the business side of it was like, oh, my goodness. People said, well, do you have any order forms to where we can order? I said, no, I'm not going to be in the shirt business. I just was, you know, this was just something I like to do, and since there was an expert, I made them for other people, and I hope they make you happy. So my thought was I made lots of money from that, and then I thought, okay, I seem to have the ability to put into action immediately whatever I decide I want to do. And that's one of the things that I think hold many women back is because they have their ideas. They may write them down on paper, but they don't have the execution. And if they have, let's say if they have, children, they have a job, they're exhausted, they have a husband, or they're dating someone, or they're going through a divorce, or whatever they have going on in their life, they're not compartmentalizing their dreams. 
So every single thing that happens in my life that I've been able to do, I compartmentalize. My sister died 10 days ago. I buried her last Saturday. I did the news today, and I'm on the call right now. There are things that you have to compartmentalize to make sure that each part of your life runs like a machine. For me, I believe that if you're doing your business, that the main thing that you have to focus on is whatever your business is, you have to make sure that you have a brand. And I know that we like to talk about branding, and, but the best thing about it is, for me, I believe that whatever your brand is, you have to live your brand. You have to eat, breathe, and sleep your brand because your brand is your business. And the way I've lived my life is I've always thought about the way I am every single day needs to be consistent. If I run into President Obama tomorrow, I'm going to be consistent. I don't worry about my brand. It's always the same. And at the same time, in your dreams that you have for the goals and the visions that you have for your business, whatever it may be, keep your dreams to yourself. So write out your execution. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we have ideas, and if you repeat your idea to so many people and they hear your ideas, oh, that's a good idea. You have two or three things that can happen. Number one, somebody could steal your idea and put the plan into action and then say, I could have done that. Or number two, somebody else is like, oh, that's just another one of your ideas. You know they always come up with stuff, but they don't ever get it done. Or number three, your idea is just going to be something that becomes your nemesis, the thing that you never got done. So dream it, write it down, and write out your plan of execution. And I know it's common for people to say, what is your five-year goal? I've never been a five-year goal kind of person. I believe that any goal that you have can be reached within six months to a year. If it's something that's going to be successful, it will be successful within a year. Now, that may be a year of struggle, but if after one year you're still struggling, then maybe you need to switch what you're doing. Or maybe you need to refocus, or maybe you've lost your way, or maybe you didn't get the right mentor to teach you what you needed to do. Or maybe that seed money that you thought that you needed, you misappropriated it. Because remember, I took a coach back to a pawn shop and got a couple of, a couple of hundred dollars to be able to make over 5000 because I understood the value of what I needed to do. As a woman, you're not going to have the same benefit of being able to say, oh, well, let's go hang out over here and let's go meet up on the golf course. But in the business that I'm in, in my law practice, I'm the only black woman at my level in the practice area that I'm in. There is no other one. I was a partner at my last law firm, and I was the very first female partner and the first black one, and I ran the Texas office. After I decided that I needed to stop making hundreds of millions of dollars for my boss, the comment was made to me by my boss's girlfriend at the time, oh, my goodness, it looks like we'll be able to get another G6 since you've done so great. And I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, he's going to have a G6, and I, I just have an S6. <laughs> so my thought was maybe it's time for me to go. And when you take huge risks, you have the greatest reward because I made the decision February the 11th to leave my law firm at the beginning of the year, and I had a $20 million book of business at the time at the firm. And as a partner at a law firm, you're not allowed to poach your clients. You're not allowed to steal your clients. When you leave, you have to go out the door. But being the smart woman that I am and I knew what I needed to do, I didn't go the end around. I decided to go ahead and sit my boss down and say, I'm leaving the firm and I know the rules. So here's what we're going to do. All of the clients that I have brought to this law firm over the last year and a half, we're going to call them on speakerphone. And since I know the rules, I'm going to give them the option to either stay with you or go with me on my own. Now, I hadn't created my firm yet because that would have been illegal. And as shocked as my boss was, I said, let's start with the letter A. And at the very first phone call, I said this, hi, X, it's Nyanza. It's like, hey, Nyanza, how you doing? I said, I just want to let you know I'm leaving my law firm. And at this very moment, I'm starting on my own. Do you want to stay with this firm or do you want to go with me? He said, hell, I'm going with you. You've made me lots of money. That was client number one. All the way from A to Z, every single client went with me out the door. I had $10 million that walked with me out the door, and I didn't even have an office. I had one by the next day, though. And since then... I mean, the way I run my business, even with my clients now, 
I am in the litigation world, which you would call a rainmaker. And it's not that I do something that's different from everybody else. It's just that because I understand that you have to be well-connected and you have to have a brand and you have to be focused and you have to be consistent, and when you're all of those things, people in business gravitate towards you, and people will then offer things to you that they would not have otherwise offered, like seed money, like office space, like advertisement, like a building, like let me do this for you. But when you have those things offered to you and you take them and then you show gratitude, God will bless your business and it will grow. I know I have more time, but I'm going to let you guys ask me questions if you have any. Oh, that's phenomenal, Sister Nyanza. I'm over here taking notes and tweeting on your behalf. Oh, um, and I, I should have been on my Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I got you. Sister Sidney, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. I don't know what happened. I apologize about that. That was truly awesome. Thank you. I got a page for the notes. Yeah. We are going to go to um, our next uh, speaker, Crystal, Sister Queen, Crystal Washington. Are you on the line, Sister Crystal? I'm here. How are you? And, and thank you for being on the line. Oh, no, no. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so blessed to be here. And uh, I'm in good company with Nyanja. Nyanja was spitting some fire right there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> was she, though? She was. I love it. <laughs> so... This sister right here, uh, Queen Crystal Washington, like Sister Queen Nyanza, she is a mover and a shaker in her field as well. And so, um, you know, as Nyanza talked about being the only one in her area in that particular field, I'm quite sure uh, Sister Crystal will explain to us what she does in the area, and she works with so many powerful companies. Um, so let me go into her bio really quickly. It says, when powerful companies want their teams to take action online, they book social media expert and dynamic speaker Crystal Washington, who has worked with Google, Microsoft, GE, and others in the U.S., Africa, and Europe. For this comprehensive knowledge on the social media, she has been interviewed by ABC, NBC, Fox, CBS, and numerous radio stations and magazines around the globe. Queen Crystal is well known for her ability to take complex web and social media topics and make them easy to understand and accessible for everyday people and small business owners. She owns CWM Enterprises, a social media instructional brand aimed at training everyone from Generation Ys to baby boomers in strategically using social media, educating consumers on the practical application of social media, networks like Facebook, Twitter, like LinkedIn, and YouTube is her passion. As a recognized authority on social media, she has appeared in the Huffington Post, Entrepreneur Magazine, Glamour Magazine, Bloomberg Business Week, and in the Associated Press. She was the past host of a weekly technology segment on Houston's Fox television affiliate. Queen Crystal is the author of the book, The Social Media Why, a busy professional's practical guide to using social media, including LinkedIn, I'm sorry, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, Google+, and blogs for business. Without further ado, we would like to introduce Queen Crystal Washington. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, again, I'm extremely honored to be on the call today. Um, you know, I really took some time to think about what message I wanted to say to make it succinct for the ladies on the call. And, you know, I just wanted to share a few lessons that I've learned along the way in building my business because I'm in a kind of strange industry, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that shortly. But one thing that I figured out very, very early in life is that marketing matters. And, and it actually feeds into something that Nyanza said. That's why I said she was spitting fire because I was in so much agreement when she talked about your brand. What I learned is that the quality of your work matters and how you wrap that work matters. I learned as a child that you could wrap a C-plus paper in an A um, presentation. So all, if you want to you know, get professional binding on it, take it to Kinko's, that might be a C-plus paper, but you're going to get an A on it every single time because of how you package it. And I think that applies not only to our level of work, and I'm not saying that we should do C-work, 
But what I am saying is that your packaging matters. And it's not just about looks and appearance. It's about how you carry yourself. It's about the standards you set for yourself. It's the work that you complete. Also at a young age, um, probably similar to Nianza, I hustled from day one. There was something in me that was entrepreneurial. So I remember having little businesses in elementary school where we would sell little Avon products and friendship bracelets at lunch and take all the little kids' lunch money. They, they eventually shut us down because kids weren't eating because they were buying our little baggies of stuff, right? So I think it's a matter of looking at opportunities and figuring out what you can do to monetize the situation. In middle school, I remember I started a business. One of my neighbors was an artist. She was going into a retirement home. She had all these little cardboard insert picture frames. And I decided, I knew that people loved doing scrapbooks and yearbooks every single year. And so I thought, why not do something mid-year in middle school where they'd have like these signature books, then they wouldn't have to wait till the end of the year. So I decorated these things using the supplies she had given me for free. Um, I, I decorated them in school colors, gang colors, because I knew my audience and I was at a rough school at the time, and sold out in a matter of a couple days of, of all the products. So again, it's about seeing the demand around you. And as I got older, I started seeing demand. So fast forward, my degree is in hospitality, and I went into the hospitality industry, always sales and marketing. Um, but I ended up starting a marketing firm. And from there, I became a professional speaker who spoke on marketing. But when I first quit my job to start my own business, because like Nyanza, when you're in sales, you see how much money you're making in your company compared to how much you're making. And the complaint was not that I wasn't making good money. The complaint was that I was not making anywhere near as much money as I was making the organization I was working for. And in addition to it, you know, dealing with issues of sexism, racism, everything else, I knew that I wanted to control what I was doing. And so I started my marketing business, and when I first started it, I realized while my business was making enough money to support itself in the very beginning, if I wanted any side money myself, I needed an extra hustle. And so to show you all how value works and how you can find value in anything, it's about being perceptive. I actually started a side hustle to make several hundred extra dollars a month just to spending money so I would have that by looking at Craigslist and noticing a pattern. And that pattern was this. I noticed that at the end of the month, everybody was looking for moving boxes because no one wanted to pay full price for moving boxes. Come the beginning of the month, everybody was giving away moving boxes because they had just moved and they didn't know what to do with all these boxes. And so what I would do is at the beginning of the month, I would just go and pick up boxes from five or ten, you know, five or so people, go ahead and hold those for a couple weeks, flip them, and sell each box, I think, for like $1.50, $2 a piece, and make a few hundred extra bucks a month flipping boxes. It didn't cost me anything. So again, there's value in everything, and it doesn't take a lot of money to start a business. My marketing firm, I started with about 100 and I think about $115 was how much it started. Uh, it took for me to just build a basic website and get things going. Now, moving forward a little bit. Now I'm a professional speaker. Over 90% of my business revenue is generated through me standing on a stage and talking. And I want you all to think about how wild that is, that you can actually make an extremely good living speaking. There's value in what you have to say. There's value in the knowledge that you acquire. Now, in the course of this business, um, this is a little different than a lot of other businesses because you then become a commodity. When Microsoft decides they're doing their annual meeting every year and they're looking for speakers to fill certain slots, you are now a commodity. If they want someone to speak on LinkedIn, here's three speakers that do it. They're going to choose one. Now you're like a pony. You might be a brown pony, a speckled pony, or a black pony or whatever. They're choosing between them. And so it's really about how you present yourself and how you market yourself. And so in my industry, what I've had to learn is really the power of negotiation. And that's something that, as women, we are not taught to do. And that's one reason why I think I find myself in a lot of spaces, because speaking is dominated by men, specifically white men. I find myself in spaces where not only do I not see brown people, I don't see women at all, because we're not taught 
to stand up for our value and to know how to demand a certain price level. And so I think a lot of this goes back to knowing how to set standards for yourself. Um, for those of you that have businesses or want to have businesses, you have to become very, very comfortable with saying no. You have to be comfortable with saying no to clients. You have to become comfortable with firing clients. You have to know what your value is and also be willing to walk away if they're not willing to um, accommodate you at the level that you know you're deserving of. And I think that's a lesson that's not only in business, it's in life in general. As women, typically, we are socialized to be nice. We are socialized to be caretakers. And I think this, you know, those are admirable traits. However, I see it hurting most of the women that I have run into in, in my life because they don't know how to draw that line and they don't know how to say no when they need to. So I think a good portion of it is knowing what value you bring to the table, pricing yourself accordingly, and knowing that you're not going to fall beneath that level. And so that's kind of like the, the kind of bird's eye view of where I'm at right now. And I'm very, very big. Anyone that knows me and Sadia, you know, we've known each other for a little bit of time. And you see the kind of information I give people. I'm very, very much about valuing yourself, valuing your product. You never want to be Walmart. You never want to be the low-cost uh, competitor, whether we're talking about life, business, products, services, whatever it is, you always want to operate at a level where you're in the middle or where you're offering a premium. Because when you're in that premium space, especially in business, people treat you accordingly and your clients enable you to do a better job for them. They're not trying to tell you how to do the work. They're trusting you to have a certain level of expertise. Now, please understand, if you're going to operate at that level, you have to be at that level and be able to back it up. But typically, that's where I really recommend women aim for. So I can, I'll can i fall back for now to see. I don't know, Sadi, if you have any questions at this point. That was kind of like my overview that I wanted to share. That was, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Very, very, very powerful information. Um, and I know I'm sitting here taking notes um, because – I heard you use the word value a lot, value, 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 and how important that is um, in finding value in not only yourself but in, in everything, um, how you took those boxes and flipped them. I mean, who would have thunk it, right? <laughs> Pretty much. Right. Jesus is a beautiful example. Um, and if you have any questions, those who are listening, you can um, text 832-439. 6559. Once again, if you have any questions, you can text 832-439-6559. Um, I just had a one question, and both of you all can um, chime in on this. Um, I know it talked, um, I, <clears throat> um, Sister Nyanza talked a lot about execution and how she just found that she had a natural knack of executing. I do find that as women, a lot of times we are very, very creative, but that idea we have in our mind a lot of times rarely gets seen. We rarely have the skills, the execution necessary to bring it into fruition. So can you tell us or kind of talk about how do you execute so well? Is it just something you're born with? Can you develop that skill? How can we begin to uh, take our creativity and actually make it fruitful for us? Um, do, you want, do you want me to answer that right, or do you want Crystal to take that? I'll take no, it. No, you can take it. You can take okay. it. Okay, so here's my thought. Mm -hmm. um, when I had ideas, and people say you mm -hmm. should write down your ideas, and mm -hmm. I kept a little journal with a book of ideas. If I, if I had a dream in the middle of the night, I was like, oh, this is a good idea, I would get up and have the journal on my nightstand and write it down. Then I would do a little bit of research and try to find out who is already doing whatever this plan is that I have and find mm -hmm. out who they are, and I used to cold call people. I, wow. That's how I got then Nobody does that. That's like some, that's some old ancient stuff. People don't have enough balls to do that kind of stuff. I remembered when I decided, hmm, maybe I want to be an entertainment lawyer. And at the time, I was working at a, a big majority firm in commercial litigation, and I did a search of a black female entertainment lawyer in Dallas. That's where I was living at the time. And I was like, hmm, she looks like she has it together. She has a music label. Her husband is a music producer. She's got um, uh, the these the, well-known artist, I'm going to call her up. So I literally picked up the phone. I said, hi, 
I'm Nyanza Davis. I'm an attorney here in Dallas, and I see that you're an entertainment lawyer, and I need a mentor because I'm interested in what you do. And she literally was like, first of all, uh, I can't believe you just called me. And second of all, the fact that you did call me, I can appreciate that. And if you need me to be your mentor, I am here for you. And mm -hmm. that is the way I got my mentor. Now, I decided, okay, I'm done with entertainment law because it's not really as sexy as I thought it was going to be. And, you know, the clients were not really that nice. Most of them were buttholes. So I was like, okay, let me move on to something else. When I decided to, um, okay, so this is, some, this is something that, that you're going to hear about anyway. So I decided that I like perfume and I like things that smell good. And I like to go to France all the time. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to, bring, I'm going to make my own fragrance. And I literally, when I said I'm going to make my own fragrance, I tried to figure out what is the best place to go to make your own fragrance, and I went to France in Nice, and I went to Molinar Perfumery, and I asked the fragrance people to teach me how to make my own. And I created my own fragrance, and I, got the, I went ahead and trademarked the formula, and I brought it back to the United States, and then I made samples of what I made for my friends. And my friends were like, oh, my gosh, this is the best smelling thing in the world. I said, I have made two versions. I said, well, what do you think about this one? Oh, this one's even better. I said, okay, great. Those are my new fragrances. So my thought was, for my execution, you don't need money to execute. You need knowledge to execute. You need to do mm -hmm. research. Get the right information, okay? Make sure that if you are looking at what you want to do, when you're writing, like if I wanted to go ahead and start a car wash, my first thing I would do is like, okay, I need to find out, number one, are there any franchises of car washes already, or do I need to start one independently? Those are two good questions. Number two, hmm, how many car washes are there already in the demographic area where I live or where I want to work? Got to find that out. Easy research. Number three, are there any licenses that I need to get to be able to own a car wash? Number four, do I need to create a name? And number five, I always go down to the county clerk's office and get a DBA immediately of whatever my idea. I have about 12 DBAs downtown. Anything that I have ever thought of that I was going to do, I made a business out of it so nobody else could take it. And then I automatically go on the Internet and I go to GoDaddy and I create the web name for it as well. So I own every .com for everything I've ever thought of. So those little bitty things, those are research items that I could get done in a 48-hour period. That's the knowledge part. So then after the 48-hour period is over, I'll say, okay, now this is what I need to do to get this certificate. This is what I need. Do I need to get a bank loan or do I need to go ahead and go in on somebody else or do I need to create myself? Those are the kinds of things that you have to do to execute, and you have to give yourself a timeline. So once you have your knowledge, you need to give yourself, okay, I need to get this done by – Tuesday, I need to get this done in 10 days from Tuesday, and I need to meet with this person for lunch to discuss with somebody who's already done this before what I need to do to start my little fledgling business. Because what, what I find is that people come up to me all the time saying, how do you do this, how do you do this, and I have no problem giving them all the information that they need, anything that I can do to help them out, because the way I believe is that if I give you the information – it's just like putting, a, it's like putting an encyclopedia on top of someone's head. You cannot force them to read it. You can just give it to them. But at the same time, you cannot be the type of person that has the encyclopedia in front of you, but that does not check off the things on your list that need to be done. Because that concept of, you know, websites for dummies or speak in Italian for dummies, that concept for dummies, you, if you have an idea, there's a dummies version out there, and there's a checklist that goes along with it. You need to write out your checklist and execute it and give yourself a short time frame to get it done. And make sure that if you're married, that you have the support of your spouse. And if you're not married, then you don't need the support of anyone to validate your own idea. You can just go ahead and go for the gusto and either go all in or say, this is not really what I want to do. Mm -hmm. If I can add to that, um, and Nyanza, you once again, you killed it. I agree with oh, Nyanza you. about the research <laughs> for sure. Um, <clears throat> no one can out-research me. 
And that's how I've been able to do a lot of things in business. And by research, I don't just mean books, although I will live in a library, I will live online, but also asking people for the proper knowledge, finding people already in that industry, which Nyan's a hit on. So that's one. You have the research. You write down what you're trying to do. You write down your goals. I am a big proponent of writing down what you want, vision boards. And I don't mean just like the whole little, oh, QT, one day I want this. I mean very tangible this is my annual vision board. This is I'm looking at this every morning when I wake up. This is what I'm going for. Don't forget it. But the last key that most people miss is speed. It is my opinion that most people miss their opportunities because they are so busy either A, making excuses, or B, trying mm-hmm. to get everything perfect. The stars never align perfectly. The victory belongs to those that are willing to get out there and move fastest. So once you get that Mm -hmm. knowledge, don't make excuses, even if they're valid. Some excuses may be valid, but they will never serve you. So I don't care about excuses. Do what you have to do Mm -hmm. to get where you need to be. I have done things with fevers of 103 and 4, been sick, but still got on stage, still done what I needed to do. And and really that's a big piece of it. And so I think getting rid of those excuses and executing on that research, executing on those goals as quickly as possible because when you get that idea, I guarantee you there's at least two other people that got that exact same idea at the same time. Who's going to move first? Mm. Very, very, very powerful. Sister Sadia, did you have any questions? No, I heard you talk about – your spouse, Sister Nyanza, and, you know, you have to get your spouse um, in accord with you and these ideas. That's right. Um, do you have your spouse, are your spouses a part of your businesses? And, you know, as a, as a woman who does have a business, um, how does that affect the productivity? Do you work better together um, or do is, is it just you and he just supports you? How does that work? Okay, so let's see. Um, it's, I've had it two ways since I've had a few businesses since I've been married to my husband. We're, we just celebrated our 11th year a couple of days ago. So in the beginning steps, with my law practice, of course, that's me by myself on my own. Um, with my other businesses, you know, he does not work with me. He supports me. Like whenever I used to make hats and fascinators, he would be the one – making sure that everything was set up. He is my support system, but I don't want my husband to become my employer because in the marriage, he's the king of the marriage. So I cannot have him then being my business partner and then becoming the king of my business because then it won't be my business anymore. So he understands, and, I, and, I made, and we've, we've gotten up at a point in our relationship where he understands that I'm the type of wife that I will defer to my husband. However, when I'm laser focused and I know that I'm right, I will pursue that goal and show him this is why I had to do it this way, baby. And then he gets to see the success. And he also understands that his role as the husband is to be supportive. And if the business works, that's great. If it fails, he's like, baby, that's fine. Just start another one. But at the same time, you have to – Working with your spouse is not the type of relationship that I would think would be as healthy for the marriage. It may be great for the business, but then you have to go home. And if you're not able to just go home and talk to your spouse and unwind and say, you know what, I had a really rough day, because he may have been the cause of your rough day if you work together. So you need some type of sounding board in your husband and then your business can be separate. Now, there are some people who say, hey, we've decided to both quit our jobs, and we're going to start this car wash together. Well, that's great, but at the same time, if the car wash fails, one person still needs to have a steady income. See, we made the choice in our marriage that I will work, and I'm not, and see, and you have to also not be a lazy woman. Now, some women are just lazy, and I just happen to be, the, the complete opposite. I don't plan to ever retire until I'm in the grave. So my husband understands that for me, I must always have businesses and I have to be the boss of my business because I'm going to run it effectively, ethically, and I'm going to execute it, and it's going to make a profit no matter what. 
his job is to be the one to where when I need to leave my law firm to be like, okay, baby, you ready to leave him? I got you. And so when I walked out of the door as a partner, I didn't know I was going to walk out with any clients. But he was the one that had the stable job who's been in his same career for 18 years working at the same pharmaceutical company. So he was the one who was going to be able to carry me if necessary. But it didn't end up being necessary. You know, and sometimes we do, you know, we, we have a tug of war where he tries to, like a couple of days ago, he just said to me, well, did you remember to call that client back? And I said, well, did you remember not to tell me to call my clients? Because sometimes <laughs> he does want to help. And right. I that. Okay. We, but, but you can't be my boss. <laughs> right. <laughs> Very good. I see there's a question from a 504 area code. Um, but that was some very, very good information. I am sitting here and taking so many notes. Um, <laughs> and some take a home take takeaway for me is that research and getting the actual facts so that you would know how to proceed efficiently, and not to take too long to execute and to execute with speed and eliminate excuses, and that you don't have to be perfect to move out. Uh, motion doesn't have to be perfect. You just got to create some motion. Um, okay. You know, and I, have I, I just have to ask, a, I have to make a quick point if that's okay, and that is I don't see how people can be successful in business and have a spouse that is not supportive. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I see people in that position, and it's really, really hard for them. And so if you don't have a supportive spouse, it's going to make things so much harder because your spouse is the person that can even either propel you forward or can completely halt the process. In my situation, both me and my husband have businesses, two totally different businesses. Now, he comes in and helps me in my business when I need help with things. I come in and help him with his business when he needs help with things. But we are very, very clear about the fact that I reign supreme over my business and he reigns supreme over his. And we've had a very respectful relationship where we kind of come in and I say, well, you know, I see something. Do you, do you want my advice? And I wait for that opening and vice versa. And so I just have to say that for those that are listening that are not yet married, if you're going to get married, make sure that you choose someone who is supportive and doesn't just expect you to be the support. Um, Because if that's what you're signing up for, it's going to be extremely difficult for you to be able to have a business. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, we can take a question from Ms. Waikiti. Yeah, I am just really, really, really honored to have these queens of this magnitude to join us tonight. This is always an awesome call, but tonight it especially uh, hits home for me because I am, too, a striving entrepreneur. And I wanted to um, just ask quickly, I know you all talked about being able to work with your husband and making sure that you have the support of your husband. How important is the network of other women that you see around? How important is that to develop as a network of women as we all, as Sister Crystal mentioned several times, having to face sexism and racism and all of those different things? How important is it that we support one another as women? And what are you all doing or what type of networks do you all belong to that help to support other women and female entrepreneurs such as yourselves? Well, Crystal, I'll let you go first. Okay. Um, for me, I think it's important that you have a network of people because what happens is it's very, inter- it's, it's very, very easy to get caught into our comfort zones, right, where we're only connecting with black women or minority women or just women or black people. And you need a diverse network because depending on the type of business that you're trying to execute, you might need contacts outside of people that look and act just like you. Now, don't get me wrong. I do think it's extremely important to support women and have women support you. Um, I think it's important to have people around you that know you're struggling can identify because there's going to be some days where something's going to hit you upside the head that you're not even going to know how to deal with. And so being able to come to someone else that deals with similar situations is extremely important. But if you are an African-American woman and you don't have any Hispanic men or Asian men or, you know, white women or whatever else in your circle, you are going to be limited, Um, especially if you have a business where you want to go international. You're going to need international contacts. And so my answer to that is it's extremely important to have a network of women 
but it's even more important to have a network of people. Um, because at the end of the day, I honestly think your network is your most important asset. Anything else, you can hire someone to fill in the gap. If you need somebody to be the face of your product, maybe you don't feel like you're the cutest on the planet, you can hire someone to do that. If you don't have the knowledge set, you can hire someone with the knowledge set. What you cannot do is leverage someone else's network without having that other person in your network. And so do not get comfortable and just go with the people that you feel are like you. I 1,000% agree. Well, I guess I should say I just 999% agree. Um, for me, I believe that, you know, I am a reader, and I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Malcolm Gladwell, but he is a famed and New York Times bestselling author, and one of his books was called The Tipping Point. And, you know, we all know that we are six degrees of separation from someone else and all that kind of business. But he said that there are certain types of personalities, and um, I have the person, there are mavens, salesmen, and connectors. I'm a connector, and, you know, connectors know lots of people. They're the kind of people who know everyone, and they make it their business to know everyone, even if it has nothing to do with their business or something they're trying to do. So for me personally, I've always thought that I don't look at my business as I need to go out there and try to network within my field. I've always thought about socially, I always like to know someone in every area, no matter what it is, no matter if it's, it's, a, if it's a carpet bagger or a horse trainer or something. I'm a connector. And so what I have found is that I'm able to benefit immensely now because I have made it my business to be a person who knows almost anyone in any field, and when someone can call me and say, hey, do you know anybody that can help me out with this? I connect them with that person instantly. So what that does is it's kind of like a situation where I've done this for so many people over the years that they all view me as the person that put them in touch with the person that made their dream happen, and I didn't ask for anything in return. So when I have my business, I use all my connections. When I put something out on Facebook or social media or Instagram, and if I say I have a new product that I'm about to launch, I'm so well connected already that those people that I have already put together will act as salespeople for me to vouch for me because I have already paid it forward with them years ago. So now socially, like let's just say with women's organization, I am an Alpha Kappa Alpha woman. I am in Jack and Jill. I am a member of the Lynx Incorporated. I am in all of these things. I'm in all of these illustrious organizations. I do lots of volunteer work, and I do lots of campaigning for people. I hold lots of fundraisers. And I do those things because I like to stay connected to everyone who's doing anything that may be of interest. So I can put them in contact with each other because that's the reason why you know, when I meet clients, you know, most of my clients, they, they've never had a black woman lawyer that's handling their $10 million claim. And so, that first of all, you know, you're in an industry where, number one, you're a woman. Number two, you're like, okay, most people make the deals out on the golf course. That's how you get to sign the big clients, the commercial clients, and that's what I do. But instead, I'm, I'm a connector. I will meet them wherever, and they'll be like, hey, do you know so-and-so? I said, I, you know what? I do, as a matter of fact, and if you want to meet him, I know somebody I can put you in touch with to get it done. And then I follow through on everything. Now, what, that's one thing that people are lacking. When you meet somebody out there in the business world or just in your regular life, if you say you're going to do something, do it. If you say, hey, you know, let's go to lunch, immediately send them an invitation, let's go to lunch next week, what does your calendar look like? Hey, why don't we meet up for happy hour and talk about so-and-so? Immediately do that. Sometimes if you met somebody, hey, I said I would give you a call. Let's chat. Let me know if you're in town. Follow up. When you follow up with somebody, send a handwritten note, whether it's an email, a text message, or something else, even if it's three days later, don't let that person escape you because that may be an opportunity that comes back to you later on. So as far as needing a strong group of women in my network, I don't need that because I feel like I have to be a connector in every facet, whether it's business or not. And, I, you know, I'm not in the Chamber of Commerce because I feel like I am the Chamber of Commerce. 
People come to me when they need business. When people come to me when they say, Nyanza, do you know somebody who can do this? Yes. Well, do you know somebody? My grandmother was like that. My mother is like that. So I'm the same way. So these women who are like that, if, people, if women know that they can call me and say, Nyanza, where can I get the best so-and-so? Because I know you know. Okay, well, let me tell you. Because I don't have a problem giving information. If you're the type of woman that does not mind telling all of your secrets to all of your fabulousness, then you will always be successful. But if you're the kind of woman that feels like, well, I don't want to tell her this because then she might act like she want to, she want to try to jock my style or try to be like me, well, then that, you're not the right kind of woman, and you're not going to be successful. Because if you're com- busy competing with everybody else or trying to hold everybody else's dream back, God's not going to give you your own dream. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Very, very, very powerful words. We are just, <laughs> you can listen all day. That was very, very uh, profound words. Um, and we're going to, are there any other questions that we have? Sister Waikiti, did you have a follow-up question or that was good? They answered. No, I don't have a follow-up question. I definitely um, appreciate mm-hmm. everybody's feedback. I think that you all have been, I mean, I've, I'm taking just as many notes as everyone else. Yeah. It's just been an awesome call. It's been an awesome call. I would love to have you all on again for a part two. You know, mm-hmm. soon, as soon as your calendar allows, it would be <laughs> awesome if we can do, you know, you, just mm-hmm. just to have an opportunity to get some feedback from some of the callers who are on who may be a little bit shy right now to ask some questions. But, you know, I've learned a tremendous amount from you all. I have to. And if you enjoyed this call, as I have and as I really, really know that you have, Please join us for our next conference call that is um, in April, on April the 28th. We will be featuring um, Zaza Ali. She is an author of the book Black Matters, um, and as well as our May call, which we have a special guest, Tamara Winfrey, uh, <coughs> who will be um, – presenting as well. She's the author of The Sisters Are All Right, Changing the Broken Narrative of Black Women in America. But I have to thank, thank once again our wonderful, powerful, inspirational, um, really strong sisters um, and queens, Nyanza and Sister Crystal, for taking time out of your schedule to come and speak with us, to come and share with us. And this is what it's all about, and this is what the Queen Calls are designed for, is to share knowledge. And when we share knowledge, we really empower one another. And as our beautiful sister Nyanza said, when you share and empower one another, you are empowered as well. Um, And so thank you, thank you, thank you so much again. I am so inspired, um, and I just can't wait to compartmentalize my notes so I can read this over (laughs) again, right? Um, So I can read this over again because I'm truly, I'm not just saying this, I'm truly inspired and motivated um, from this call tonight. Um, And so with that being said, we want all of our listeners this evening to like us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, as well as visit our page at www.myqueendomcome.org. We also would like to invite everyone who's listening to our April 15th Sister Summit 2016, and the title of that is Reclaiming Your Purpose on Purpose. making something of yourself. And we had uh, that first one last October. It was very, very uh, phenomenal. You do not want to miss it if you're in the Houston area. Um, Please go to our website and register yourself, your daughter, your nieces, and please come on April 15th to our Sister Summit 2016. Um, And with that being said, we would like to close out this call by reminding our sisters and encouraging them, um, you know, Really, and, and really we want to leave you with really telling you how valuable, that we love you, and how important you are. But to always remember that when you teach a man, you teach an individual. But when you teach a woman, you teach a nation. Until next time, queens, may God bless you to have a wonderful, wonderful evening. <laughs>